Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Micha Breshar from the University of Warwick, who will give a talk on the rates of convergence to stationarity for some classes of diffusions. OK, thank you for the introduction. And big thanks to the organizers who gave me the opportunity to present here. So today, I'll be talking about rates of convergence to stationarity of various Markov processes. And the focus will be the impact of the multiplicative noise on this convergence. So what is the structure of this presentation? We will start with reflecting diffusions in generalized parabolic domains, follow up those results uh, with, some temp with some results on tempered Langevin diffusions. And that's how we will introduce uh, the problem and the effect of multiplicative noise on the convergence. In the second part of this talk, We'll talk about diffusion models in generative modeling. We'll describe the model and introduce some probabilistic questions that appear and try to show some results um, in this context using the intuition we build in part one of the talk. So let's start with stochastic reflection. We consider d plus one, we consider stochastic, the stochastic reflection, so um, reflected diffusions in d plus one dimensional domains, unbounded in one direction, spherically symmetric in other b directions, smooth on the compact sets, and as smooth everywhere, and in particular on compacts, and domains that asymptotically shrink as x to the beta, where beta is some power between minus infinity and zero. We let the reflection vary on compact sets, and asymptotically, we assume that the reflection is more. And then the main character of this talk, process with multiplicative noise, we let the multiplicative noise, so this um, covariance function sigma, be uniformly elliptic on compact sets. But asymptotically, we add additional assumption that the variance in horizontal direction stabilizes in and that uh, the combined variance in the other d directions also stabilize. And the first question is, can we somehow classify ergodicity under these general assumptions? And can we classify precisely the rate of convergence and see which parameters govern this rate of convergence? And the answer is yes, asymptotic properties, asymptotic assumptions on the domain and variance do allow us to classify convergence, and they also govern the rate of convergence. So let's see what the rate of convergence is. The rate of convergence depends on the domain. So if domain shrinks faster, the rate of convergence is faster. Uh, it uh, depends on the ratio between variance in vertical and horizontal direction. And that's it. So the only thing that governs this rate of convergence to stationarity are asymptotic assumptions on the model. So if, someone, if one varies multiplicative noise asymptotically, you can, one can get very different rates of convergence. In particular, let's consider a fixed domain that shrinks like x to minus 1, so beta equal to minus 1. If we have as if we asymptotically assume that the variance in y direction is barely bigger than variance in x direction, we, we see a very slow polynomial rate of convergence. But if we just change this asymptotic value, if we just change sigma asymptotically, and we have variance in y direction, which is significantly larger than variance in x direction, we can get arbitrarily fast convergence to stationarity. And this might be a slightly surprising result because this rate of convergence depends on the marginal. And marginal depends on the sigma on the whole domain. So it might be, uh, it might be strange that the only thing that governs convergence are the asymptotic assumptions on sigma. And one, of the, one natural explanation would be that if you vary sigma on compacts, uh, the invariant measure pi also changes. So that's why only asymptotic uh, properties of the model govern its convergence. 
And this introduces a natural question. Can we compare two stochastic processes, two diffusions, which have the same invariant measure, one with additive noise and the other with multiplicative noise, and see if multiplicative noise can impact convergence to stationarity in this case. And the easiest model we can study in this context are tempered Langevin diffusions. So what are those? Consider a smooth density on RD. Then we can construct a diffusion process whose invariant measure has a density pi. So we have a smooth density pi on RD. And then Langevin diffusion is a diffusion which has invariant measure with density pi. This is a well-known process, has been studied for many years. And let's see what is the convergence rate to pi for this process. So if we have, all, we have polynomial density that decays asymptotically as x to minus alpha, alpha of course has to be more than d, otherwise this is not a probability measure, then the convergence to stationarity uh, is uh, decays polynomially as alpha minus d over 2. So if we have a very, very heavy tail invariant measure, something that's barely integrable, the convergence is very slow. And the natural question is, can we construct another process, another diffusion process with multiplicative noise, which admits the same invariant measure, and how will this impact the rate of convergence? So this larger family uh, of processes is known uh, as tempered Langevin diffusions. If we choose a parameter m equal to zero here, we recover the classical Langevin diffusions. But if we choose m positive, we see a diffusion which has the same invariant, which has for fixed pi the same invariant measure as a diffusion above, but also admits multiplicative noise. So let's see how the rate of convergence looks for these processes. So if we choose M positive, such that our multi multiplicative noise grows, uh, in, such that our multiplicative noise is unbounded and grows as, as X to the L, where when X goes to infinity, the rate of convergence to the same pi as above is a lot faster. In particular, when, for example, alpha is equal to D plus one, the rate of convergence above is polynomial t2 minus 1 half. And here, when alpha is d plus 1, if we can choose, uh, if we choose l close to 2, we get rate of convergence, which is of arbitrarily, arbitrarily fast polynomial. So given pi, one, uh, one can achieve much faster convergence rates if, you if one considers diffusions with unbounded multiplicative noise. And the faster this unbounded multiplicative noise grows asymptotically, the faster is the convergence rate. And in particular, for the choice of L equal to 2, you can actually get exponential convergence. And there is another thing that makes this uh, example interesting. And that is that in the case where you see exponential convergence towards uh, polynomial targets, this multiplicative noise grows linearly. So we, we didn't construct some uh, horrible diffusion with super linear coefficients that uh, are very difficult to work with. Uh, this is a diffusion with linear coefficients and with polynomial invariant measure. Uh, so we have these results. We saw that in some rather elementary models, multiplicative noise modified only asymptotically can significantly impact the rate of convergence to stationarity. And now uh, the question becomes, uh, are there any, prob any natural problems where we can investigate how would uh, multiplicative noise, go where, where the questions of convergence to stationarity for diffusions are natural to tackle? And I now enter the noising diffusion probabilistic models. 
those are the noisy diffusion probabilistic models are a novel advancement in AI and generative modeling, which have led to state of the art results across various domains. And these models essentially want to achieve uh, what they what these models want to achieve is they want to create artificial sa samples of a certain type. And in this picture, we see want to, we want to create artificial samples of pictures of cats. And I will briefly describe here the model and explain how to make this work. One needs to answer a very elementary probabilistic question. Uh, so let's see how these models work. The first thing we, we have to do is collect a large sample of pictures of cats. These pictures are d-dimensional when d is a number of pixels, uh, which is for a picture like this around a million. So this will be a very high dimensional problem. The next step we have to do is we need to destroy this sample by running a diffusion process. So we have some pictures of cats and, in each, and we run a d-dimensional diffusion process to destroy this, this data set, this sample. And why is that a good idea? Well, SDs and diffusions can be reversed. So if we somehow learn to reverse this procedure, go from a noise distribution back to the original distribution, we will be able to generate artificial samples, artificial pictures of cats. So the mathematical theory is uh, quite old and well established. For a forward diffusion, we just run a diffusion towards its invariant measure, which will produce a noise, uh, a noise distribution. And for the reverse uh, diffusion, we have a formula from Anderson from 82 that tells us exactly how this diffusion looks like. So this diffusion, uh, this, dr this drift of the uh, reverse diffusion depends on the drift of the forward diffusion, uh, sigma of the forward diffusion, and the difficult part, the gradient of log of Q, where Q is the marginal density of the forward diffusion. And because this marginal density is a forward SDE, initial, initialized some strange data distribution, uh, this part is very difficult to obtain. And this is where uh, very computationally expensive machine learning comes into play. So uh, this is the theory behind these processes. Let's see how the algorithm works and where the problems are and what, uh, what is the natural probabilistic question behind this problem. So obviously uh, there are problems when you try to run uh, this kind of algorithms. The first one is that to go from a sample, a picture of a cat, to noise distribution, one would have to run a diffusion process indefinitely to reach its invariant measure. This is, of course, not possible. So we have to term terminate the distribution at some terminal time t, which won't be exactly the same as the stationary distribution of this forward diffusion process. So this introduces the first error term for this algorithm. The second error term for the algorithm appears uh, because we cannot run those forward and, back, uh, and reverse diffusions continuously. But what we have to do is discretize and run the algorithm discreetly. And we do this with uh, things like Euler schemes, and this introduces a second discretization error, which, as you can see, increases in time. And the third error term is the thing I described before. So uh, the difficult part for the running a reverse process is that you don't know exactly what the density of the forward process is. So you need to estimate it with score matching, which is a machine learning technique. And we won't uh, spend time on this. Just note that this error also increases in time. So we come to an interesting situation. We have three errors of these algorithms. The second and third errors are increasing in time. And the first one is decreasing in time. So we have a diffusion process started at some strange data distribution. And we want it to reach its invariant measure as fast as possible. So this 
introduces a natural probabilistic question, given some strange data distribution, find a process that will converge to its invariant measure in the smallest time possible. And this is what we have here. We have a question, which forward process to choose? And if you didn't like the previous slide because you don't like machine learning and generative modeling, we're back at probability and we will not depart the realm of probability for the rest of the talk. So the canonical choice for these forward processes is the ornstein ullenbeck process, which is very convenient because we know the marginals, the invariant measure is a normal distribution and the, it converges to its invariant distribution exponentially. So it can't be a horrible choice. But the natural question, especially based on what we saw in the previous part of the presentation, is if another diffusion can do better. So for instance, can adding some multiplicative noise help us significantly improve the convergence? And before we start uh, trying to answer this question, we have to define the problem more precisely in the probabilistic language. And uh, in particular, what we have to do is put some assumptions on the initial data distribution. We need to understand what this row zero really is. So what is the assumption? What we learn from uh, people that use these processes in applications is that these initial distributions tend to be very irregular. Uh, they don't necessarily admit density or moments or log concavity. And these distributions are highly multimodal. And so that's why we don't assume any density, KL divergence moments or log concavity. We just assume that this is a very general distribution on RD and we parameterize those distribution with respect to the distance to their furthest modes. So what I'm saying here is that there exists a mode that's further away than any other mode. Uh, its neighborhood charges a significant mass and there is essentially no mass further away uh, than the furthest mode. And under this general assumption, uh, we can try to compute what happens if you run an OU process, initialize it at the distribution like this one. Uh, so we see a curious thing that if you run an ornstein ullenbeck process, initialize at this kind of distribution, it will, and you wait time slightly less than log of r, when r is the distance to the furthest mode, the process will be very far from converging. But if you run the OU process for a slightly more time than log of r, the process will be very close to converging, which means that if you fix a certain tolerance level and then run this distance to the furthest mode to infinity, you see a cutoff-like phenomenon. Okay, so this is the theory. Let's try to run the OU process initialized at some of the images and see what really happens. And we first simulate the OU process at some uh, lower dimensional picture of uh, dimension 32 times 32. And in this case, the OU converges very fast, as you see here, and we see no cutoff. But then we tried running the OU at some very high dimensional image, and we see a behavior closer to a cutoff phenomenon. So for a long time, OU process is very far from converging, and then for a brief period, we see exponential decay, and then the process essentially converges. So this motivates the previous question. Can we, in these algorithms, run another diffusion that's not an ornstein ullenbeck process that will significantly improve the convergence speed so we'll get rid of this period where the process is far from converging? Can multiplicative noise help also in this case? And what we see, what, what we do, is we compare the convergence of the ornstein ullenbeck process with some tempered Langevin diffusions, uh, which you've seen before, and we introduce some additional technical assumptions, such as that the invariant measure is spherically symmetric, which means that the invariant measure is similar to the one in the OU process and also easy to sample. 
And then we introduce some additional uh, technical assumptions, which essentially tell us that the invariant, which essentially holds true for all sufficiently light-tailed invariant measures. And this is also natural because we are extending the family of measure from the Gaussian measure to a larger family for general uh, Langevin temper diffusions. And again, we see, a, uh, and then again, we can answer this question. And our result goes as follows. If you initialize the process at this strange multimodal distribution and wait the time slightly less than log of r, when r is the distance to the furthest mode, no Langevin diffusion will converge. So previously we had that OU doesn't converge, but really no Langevin diffusion converges, even if they have unbounded multiplicative noise. But if you wait time slightly more than log r, the ornstein ullenbeck process will converge. So in this case, what we learn is that if you initialize the process at the multimodal distribution, the ornstein ullenbeck process is hard to beat. And this leads to, this was very surprising to us uh, because we learned in the first part of the presentation that if you are trying to, if you want the process to converge to the invariant, to the heavy tailed invariant measure, adding multiplicative noise will be of significant advantage. But in this case, it doesn't help us at all. So essentially what we've learned is that if you have a Markov process with a heavy tailed invariant measure and you start it near the origin, then adding multiplicative noise will significantly help the process transfer the, mar the marginals towards the tails and improve the rate of convergence. But if you have a process with a light tailed invariant measure and you start it at a multimodal distribution when modes are spread out, then adding multiplicative noise will not help the process push these marginals towards the origin, which is not something we've expected when we started the project. Uh, and now I want to give you some intuition about how those bounds are obtained and what really governs the convergence of all these diffusion processes from stochastic reflection to processes initialized at data distribution from generative modeling. And here we rely heavily on the idea of Martin Heider uh, from 2009. Uh, in this time, Martin Heider studied some hypoelliptic models which arise in mathematical physics. Uh, and he noticed that if you have a heavy tailed invariant measure, you can, you can find a very good approximation for total variation distance by looking at what happens in the tails. So the bottleneck for the invariant for the convergence in total variation distance will be that the marginals cannot transform enough mass to the tails. And this will give you a very good lower bound on the total variation distance. And this is the key step in the proofs of lower bounds in the case of reflecting diffusions, which you've seen in tempered Langevin diffusions. And then in contrast, in this last case, we have a reverse situation. We have a light tailed pi initialized at the multimodal uh, initial condition. And here we reverse the, uh, the inequality. So the problem is the bottleneck here in the convergence in total variation distance will be that the marginals cannot transform all the mass from the tails towards the origin. And this gives a good lower bound in this, in, uh, in this reverse case. Uh, and just, I want to mention some, uh, that there are some additional technicalities, and of course. And so the problem in this, when you try to go to heavy tailed invariant measures is that you need a lower bound on the, uh, on the invariant measure pi, which is difficult to attain in certain cases. And uh, this requires uh, new ideas. Uh, and some of them are in the papers uh, I'll show uh, after the talk. And then in this new case, when you have a multimodal invariant distribution and you are working in a very high dimensional space, you can't use this approach directly. Uh, so this whole idea has to be 
somehow projected to a low, lower dimensional space. Because this, so Hyrer worked in a two dimensional space or four dimensional space, and here we have a million dimensional space. So this cannot be applied directly, some projection could be. Uh, yes, please. Uh, so, uh, yes, R, R should be fixed. So R should be such that, I'll show you in the picture, maybe that's the best uh, way to do that. So we want to, we have an Ornstein Unbeck process in this multimodal two-dimensional distribution. And then you pick a circle, you pick a set that contains most of the measure of the invariant distribution. So some, uh, some, some circle that contains 99.9% .9 of the, of pi, and then what we do is uh, we try to see how much mass has the ornstein unbeck process managed to send towards, um, uh, towards this uh, circle around the origin. Um, and this gives you the bound. So as you can see here at T0, this is a very good bound because most of the mass is away from the origin. And at time five, um, it's also a good bound because the process is far from converging. And then when the process is, very, is nearly, uh, has nearly converged, then this doesn't give you a good bound anymore. But then also the total variation distance is low. So with the picture, this is essentially how, uh, how this lower bound works. Yes, uh, I think I don't have much time anymore. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And we have some time for questions or comments. I'm trying to understand new theorems. Uh, like, I could you please explain again about those parameters R, beta, uh, delta, uh, epsilon, delta. So, what's your assumptions on the row zero? Uh, here. Row uh, zero. Yeah, I think. Oh, uh, uh, row zero. Do it here. Yes, so we only assume that there exists a mode that's, that contains a significant mass, more than some four epsilon, where epsilon is some error tolerance, and that there is very little mass further away than this mode. So essentially, there is a mode that's further away than any other mode, and there is, there is very little mass further away. And in practice, for, for example, if you look at data sets of images, those are compactly supported. So there's no mass further away from the furthest mode, usually. And that's all we assume. We don't, there is a point where this happens, but we don't need to know where this point is. This is just, there exists a mode that's further, further away from the origin, and we parameterize the measure based on it. And that's it. Thanks. Uh, so thanks, nice talk. So in the tempered Langevin diffusion, are you allowed to choose L to be negative in principle? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, so it would probably slow things down. Uh, well, because they, I'm trying to understand if you have a heavy tailed invariant measure, yes. you have this multiplicative noise. Yes. It doesn't have any direction. And yes. so when you have heavy tails, there's a lots of mass everywhere, right? So you, that's okay because you're going to move yes. everywhere fast. Yes. Whereas here you have light tails. So it feels like the problem is more that you want the drift to speed up. You want to get to the interesting region where most yes, of the yes, mass that, is. That's essentially what happens. And that's why, that's why multiplicative noise doesn't really help. And that's why OU is the best. Yeah. So then if I was looking at this equation here, yes. it feels like if you chose M to be positive or, uh, yeah, I think M to be positive, then you might be inflating the drift and reducing the noise. If you or, M to be sorry, positive, yes, you're the opposite the, way, yeah, the opposite way to what you're thinking, yeah, and maybe you would, or maybe that that would help the, yes, that's an interesting direction. I'm not sure, you know, I'm just. Yes, 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 that's an interesting direction. Yes, definitely. But yeah, it feels like maybe this is the difference between the two scenarios that, with yes. the heavy tails, you don't mind that the the extra noise is undirected because there's mass everywhere, whereas in in your scenario here. You, you do care about where you're going. Yes. Sure. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. Are there any 
Other questions, comments? If not, uh, so let's thank the speaker again.